This is Eitan Weinstein. And I'm Naor Menninger. And you're listening to Two Nice Jewish Boys. On February 24th, 2022, Russia invaded Ukraine and set the entire world on course for turmoil. Even today, every single day, about 200 Ukrainians die in a war that no one seems to know how or when it will end. With casualties in the tens of thousands, more than 10 million Ukrainian refugees fled their homes. Those who have stayed continue to suffer from a daily dose of deadly rocket fire, hitting without any warning and causing severe casualties. Among the masses that fled was Rabbi Mendel Moskowitz. Rabbi Mendel Moskowitz is a Chabad rabbi with a long Ukrainian history. Born in Brooklyn, his parents took him to Ukraine as a baby on their mission to help Jews in the new nation emerging from the falling Soviet Union. Fast forward 32 years, Rabbi Moskowitz found himself at the crossroads of history. Rabbi Mendel Moskowitz joins us today to share his experiences in Kharkiv five months ago at the beginning of the Russian invasion. So much. Thank you so much for joining us. So much thank you. So much thank you. (laughs) That's how they say it in uh, Ukrainian. (laughs) So much thank you. Um, Thank you so much for joining us. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, Trying to get used to the the daily traffic and the different rhythm of life here in Israel. I think it's safe to say... You, life is better in right now in eastern Ukraine than in Kiryat Malachi. Could be, could be, <laughs> but that, you know, it's, it's definitely. Uh, I, and now I feel that people who make an aliyah is mm-hmm. so different, especially people with Russian or Ukrainian culture, which is a very, you know, heavy culture and a strong culture. It's it's hard. It's hard to get used to the rhythm here and the 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 people and you know. Uh, I, I, you know, I always grew up, uh, I learned in Israel for many years, so I know the Israeli, I'm married to an Israeli, so I know the culture and I know, I'm, I'm used to it, but for people, even for me, it's getting, you know, I need time to get used to it. Yeah. I've been here for 15 years, over 15 years now, and uh, I'm still getting used to it. Wow. Yeah. It's not, it's not, it's a, it's not an easy culture to acclimate yeah, to. Yeah, you feel the rhythm here. Is I was like, born here and I'm <laughs> still <laughs> getting used to it. Uh, so... It's crazy, so, it's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. absolutely. So tell us a bit about, like, let's go back to the beginning. How, well, how did your relationship with Ukraine start? You know? Right. So, did you so, live there? So, so the relationship started uh, back to the Lubavitch Rebbe who was born in the Ukraine. It was then the Soviet Union. He was born in a city called Nikolaev. And um, for many years, he escaped uh, the Soviet Union. But for many years, he wanted to bring back emissaries. There's the famous uh, Chabad emissaries all over the world. Anybody who has been to Thailand or... Anywhere in the world here in Israel, probably met somewhere Chabad. Birmingham, Alabama. Yeah. So so uh, for many years, the Lubavitch Rebbe wanted to send people to Russia and Ukraine because they were under the Iron Curtain. They couldn't get in. They couldn't get out. And people like people wanted to be Jewish. You know, people want to practice Judaism and culture, Jewish culture. And that was all under a lot of uh, s- scrutiny. And that was a big problem. So... In 1990, finally, the Lubavitch Rebbe decided to send three families, which is the chief rabbi today of Russia, the chief rabbi of Dnepropetrovsk, and the chief rabbi of Kharkov, which is my father. Together with me, I was a six-month-old baby. So I thought my story is very exciting because I was born in New York, and my mother's from Sydney, Australia, my father's from Caracas, Venezuela, uh, which was intense enough as it is. Uh, You know, kibbutz galiot, as they say here, from all over the world, and... In 1990, we found ourselves in Kharkov, the second largest city in the Ukraine. With Where the, is it on the map? It's right next to the Russian border. It's right next to the Russian border. It's, uh, it has a million and a half people. It's a very big population and a lot of Jews. So before the World War II, there were 130,000 Jews. And uh, when we came there in 1990, there were about 50,000 Jews. So a very big community as the largest synagogue in Ukraine and one of the 10 largest in the world. So it was a big uh, honor to be you know, part of something so big. 
And when we came there, like, th there was nothing going on. Like, uh, the, the, it was Soviet Union. There was no, like, we, we had to bring diapers from, from America. Like, there, there was, it was, life was so simple. I remember growing up uh, eating borscht on Thursdays. That was, like, exciting for me as a kid. Uh, so, so growing up was great, and and the people, anybody who's been to to Ukraine, the people there are nice. Obviously, a very dark anti-Semitic history. Okay, uh, my, my grandfather was actually born in Ukraine. He's a Holocaust survivor, and uh, he he used to tell me that the people of Ukraine behaved worse uh, than the the Nazi Germans to the Jews. Yeah. So, so Ukraine has a dark history of anti-Semitism, but for the past. Uh, 32 years since the breakup of communism, they made a very big effort to change that and to fix that. So me walking around as a religious Jew openly, and I never got attacked. It's a, it's a big deal. Never? never? As a kid? Never. Never I got attacked. I, I always felt comfortable. Yeah. Verbally or physically? Maybe ver verbally a little bit, but nothing compared to like Europe and certain areas in France. Like the, there, there are places that are that are much worse, including Russia, by the way. What what verbally like what what did happen? Uh, someone would uh, would walk by and say, "Oh, what are Jews doing here in Kharkov?" or like s things like that. But but uh, you could get that in America today in Karnaitz, you know. Not not like dirty Jew, but what are Jews doing here? So something that's kind of a little bit more passive. Yeah, like, like what do you like, like? Yeah, like in shock that you're here walking around. Like okay, it's not your place. Like that kind of thing. But but again, uh, we we were so good with the government, the local government. The kind of, you know, my father went a few times to the president. Uh, the mayor of the city came to my sister's wedding. The the connections that we had uh, with the local government and in the country, are, and the respect that we had from them was absolutely amazing throughout the years. So you lived in in Kharkov until what age? So when I was when I was thirteen, I went to study here in Israel for uh, for many years, and I got my rabbinical degree. I went to America as well, Australia, and um, eventually I got married to a girl from Kiryat Malachi. And uh, I just you know I wanted to go back there because I felt uh, my parents brought me up in in a, it's called in Hebrew shlichut uh, like a, I always felt like I was on a mission. By the way, any anybody with kids who's listening to this. Uh, me growing up in Ukraine was was an amazing experience because I always felt that I'm I'm like a, I'm in a James Bond uh, you know I'm 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 so it's so important for me to be here I have to help people and and that mission uh, that me feeling like I'm on a mission that's something that that really helped me be be successful and always uh, be proud of what I'm doing so I was very proud about being there because I, I felt like I was re representing Judaism in a certain way and showing people. How to be Jewish and how to light uh, menorah on Hanukkah, whatever it was, and and I always felt proud, and I wanted to marry someone who's crazy enough to leave this beautiful country and to join me in Ukraine. So that's what we did, and we're there for the past eight years together with my wife, with four of my kids. Wow, in so Kharkov. You, in so Kharkov, yeah. So you circled around the gro globe, yeah. and then made it back to Kiryat Malachi, picked up a wife, <laughs> and went, went back, back to Ukraine. Yeah, but but your father was when you came back. Your father was still. Yeah, my father. To thirty-two years, he built this amazing community with thousands of Jews. Unbelievable community, schools, everything. And he he stepped down at a certain point, or did no? He, I just came to help. You help, okay? So I came to help. I, okay. I, I I I took over in the school. You know, I I did a lot of work with the school. We have a very big school with hundreds of kids. So that's 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 the part I played there. Um, Is it a Sunday school or no, no, or like a, a proper yeah. preschool and, and a regular school with with hundreds of kids? Oh wow! And who are those kids? So that that's a very interesting question because the kids there are are uh, kids who some of them just found out that they're Jewish. So. A lot of people don't know that if their mother is Jewish, that makes them Jewish. So some people have a non-Jewish father. They think you know they're not Jewish. But then they find out one day they're Jewish. They come to synagogue or their grandmother was Jewish and they want to know more information. And we tell them that they're Jewish and they should come to our school and they should try it out. So we are like their uh, first step into Judaism. Mm -hmm. From there, some people back go to, to Israel. Judaism. Back to Judaism. Correct. Right. So everybody's Jewish and that's something you can't get rid of. And For if, some people, that's unfortunate. <laughs> and if someone's father is Jewish, they're in. Uh, and so, came so, to you. So they, yeah. So they also come because uh, the uh, our school is a public school uh, from the government. So they uh, they're allowed as well. They come as well, and we explain them the way it works, the way the system works, 
and uh, a lot of people from there continue to Israel from our schools. They learn Hebrew, they learn Jewish tradition, and from there, they a lot of them continue to Israel. So, just about the region, because you hear you people say that this is like Ukraine, but people speak Russian. It's very Russia oriented region. So, how did you experience? Are are those people there? They're Ukrainian or are they Russian? So, so that's a that's a very difficult question to answer because. It's, uh, Basically, what happened was in the Soviet Union, uh, Stalin made a very big effort to take uh, Russian speaking people and put them in uh, Georgia, all the Soviet Union countries, including Ukraine and especially Ukraine. So people next to the Russian borders, like cities like Kharkov, Mariupol, uh, surprisingly cities that are getting the most attacked right now, which is another thing that we could talk about. Um, so so these speak these cities are very Russian speaking cities because all these Russian people came from Russia. Were, uh, were forced to move, no? Were forced or? to move, yeah, yeah. The, he, he forced a lot of people to move uh, in order to disrupt the Ukrainian culture and the local culture. So for the past 32 years, Ukraine is making this effort to become... A nation. A nation, become more Ukrainian, go back to its roots, some, some darker sides of history, some better sides of history, and they're making big efforts. So, but, but in Kharkov people still feel Ukrainian, even though they're Russian speaking and they like to drink vodka and sing Russian songs. It, it's still, uh, they, they're part of the culture. They're part of Ukraine. And, and we all, I always knew growing up that we live in Ukraine and Russia is a different story. What's the dominant language in the city? Uh, the dominant language is Russian. In Kharkov, I always spoke Russian. I didn't know a word, a word of Ukrainian. All my friends spoke Russian. Um, and then with time, especially in 2014, when Russia invaded uh, Crimea, the Nets region and Lugansk, that's when things changed. That's when Ukraine made a big e- start making a bigger effort to speak only Ukrainian, etc. you know, to, to make it more Ukrainian, the country. Mm-hmm. So let's fast forward to the, uh, the, you know, late February, uh, this year. Right. So, so about a month, a month before the war started, we we're getting warnings from the United States and from Israel, uh, that we were getting messages that a war is happening, a war is going to happen, and about uh, 150,000 soldiers at a certain point were, were standing by the Kharkov border. So I live about a half an hour, 45-minute drive from the border. So this was pretty intense. Uh, friends of mine and family members from America and Israel were saying, you know, come for a few weeks. You know, something really bad is going to happen. And that was, that was a hard point for us because... On one hand, you know, we we haven't been to Israel for a long time because of COVID. It was like two years that we couldn't come. Um, so this was like an opportunity for us to go. But we understood that because we're so vital to the community, especially in the school, if we leave, the kids are not going to have their, their local rabbi. I mean, it's a big deal. And, and our whole... And basically, part of what we're doing there is, first of all, humanitarian aid. A lot of what we're doing there, Ukraine is a poor country. So usually Chabad in the world, they're, they're mainly, uh, you know, providing for tourists or spirituality and other things. But here we found ourselves uh, doing a lot of humanitarian aid because uh, Ukraine is a poor country in ge- even before the war. So this is something we were dealing with a lot, giving out food every day. We had a soup kitchen in our synagogue, just giving out food to hundreds of people. And we had a doctor with a medicine bank in our synagogue, giving out medicine to people. So that's a lot. We had a lot of experience with that. So we knew that we had to stay. We had to be there for the community, especially in these hard times where there's talk about war. And uh, a day before the war started, Putin gave this very frightening speech that Ukraine... Lenin gave Ukraine to as a present, and really it's part of Russia. And that was the first time it hit the local Ukrainian people that there's something really not right about the situation. In Ukraine, there was in general a big denial about the fact that there might be a war. But 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 the day before, when Putin gave that speech that Ukraine is part of Russia and and all that, uh, we realized that something very serious is is going down. That night, they closed off the whole. Um, Aerial, uh, uh, yeah. There's no planes. Uh, aerial plane, space. Uh, aerial space, and uh, and at five o'clock in the morning, we were woken up with explosions outside my window. So you have kids at home. Yeah, yeah. So that was that was the first thing. They they, they started crying. So so I ran to them. I picked them up. I, I you know I made sure that, that that they feel fine and safe. 
And the first thing we had to do is just find a safe place to go because I live on the fifth floor, and when there's explosions, uh, you know, you have to get into a safer place. There's no, there's no. It's not like Israel where every apartment building and every apartment has a bomb shelter. Uh, Well, uh, it's really not like in Israel. You know, in Israel, uh, besides the fact that there's so many bomb shelters around here, some some in every apartment or in every building. There's no such a thing, and there's no uh, pikud or if there's no, there's nobody tells you where a bomb falls. There's no, there's no siren. Okay, so that's insane. Yeah, so you, so you don't know. You just hear bombs. There's no sirens. You don't know. You hear the whistle of the that. You know that that's the worst part about the bomb. Mm-hmm. You know, till today that that's like the, the worst memory is not the actual explosion. It's it's there's like a a, a split of a second of that sound. Mm-hmm. Because you don't know where it's gonna fall, you don't know where it's gonna hit, and mm-hmm. and that whistle is like the is is. It's a Russian roulette, no pun intended. Yeah, oh. yeah, it's scary stuff. So where did you find safety? So my parents had a basement, so we I went I went in with them into a basement. Uh, in the, in the synagogue, we covered all the windows with. Uh, we we're building a, a mikveh there, a building, and so we took all the sandbags, we covered all the windows in the in the first floor of the synagogue, and we had over a hundred people the first day of the war who came. To find, uh, to find, you know, shelter, shelter, and to be in a safer place. They knew we have a kitchen. They knew we had we stuck stuck up on some food before, and water and other supplies. So they came to the synagogue. We brought a lot of elderly people also because we were we were afraid that the people we usually give out food won't be able to come, and uh, and that was that was a very scary. The first days of the war were very scary. Some people ran out of medicine, so that's a big deal. You know, we had to save them literally, especially people who you know insulin people who have medicine that is like could be life threatening. So so that we had a hard time trying to find different medicine in different places because that's one of the things when a war starts. These things uh, become uh, big fall ne- apart. Yeah, yeah. These things become big necessity. And uh, the first week of the war, we were there. We were in Kharkov, uh, providing for the community with food and uh, everything we can. And what was the bombing situation in this week? So the first, uh, if someone in here in Israel knows about like what Kipad Brazil sounds like, so that's what a, maybe a bit stronger. So the f- the main fighting was outside the city right outside the city but we would hear all the explosions in the city and sometimes bombs would fall in the city so for a week things were okay uh, it's hard to say okay uh, compared to what happened afterwards but but we were surviving we were there it was stressful we were hearing explosions going down all the time to the basement uh trying to call all my community members to see that they're okay everybody's doing fine uh, all the media in israel were calling me and anytime all the media is calling in israel that's usually not a good thing so um, they remember you exist yeah unfortunately they call when things are not yeah. good yeah unfortunately so they all they were all calling me at six in the morning at seven in the morning it's like this annoying me. aunt that only calls you to bring bad news yeah instead of wishing yeah you. and they're trying to be polite they were saying like oh we feel bad for you or whatever <laughs> but uh, they just want to hear what's going on yeah. they wanted the scoop yeah they, they just wanted the scoop so so they were harassing me and and the whole community and we we're trying to be in touch with everybody see what to do um, because escaping was very dangerous then. Uh, the Kharkov was surrounded with with Russian military tanks and and anything that could that could you know get you killed. And some people were getting killed on the way, so that was very dangerous. We we felt like we were stuck. You know, talking about quarantine and uh, you know the whole COVID thing. This was really a real quarantine. We we're in a basement, stuck there. And uh, I remember w- one morning uh, the. Uh, I get a call from Or Heller. He's a big uh, news guy here in Israel. And he was there in Kharkov. He was hungry. He tells me, look, I need Chabad. I'm, I'm hungry. I said, come, for sure. So he made an article and, uh, you know, we enjoyed our time together. And he told us a very scary thing. He told us that Israel notified them that they have to leave right away Kharkov. And we were very, we got very nervous because usually, you know, when Israel knows something, that means something is going on. And uh, we understood that there is something going on. We didn't know what. There was even a talk of a nuclear bomb that, that you know, something nuclear that Putin might be thinking of. So, so we were very nervous then. And the next morning, it wasn't a nuclear bomb, but Putin dropped on Kharkov tens of vacuum bombs. These are very dangerous bombs that are illegal according to international law. And buildings all around us on our street next door to our house were exploding one after another buildings residential buildings so a big myth that russia was pu- was pushing is that it's only targeting uh, military objects but then when when we were when, when when we were seeing it it was a whole different story the buildings were falling we had smoke in our house 
And and that's the moment that day, a week uh, into the war, we understood that we have to get out. That we so have it, it, it's just by chance that these that they didn't target the Chabad synagogue, your house. I, think, I mean, th- I, it, I was think it was just random. random. It was random and not random. So so there was the the local government building, right? There's no military there. It's just the local government building. That's where the mayor sits. They just completely destroy that building. So they were targeting sort of like strong, like strong like p- points, uh, targets of like powerful. Yeah, and and just random. There were random buildings, apartment buildings, many many apartment buildings, with r- only residential people living there. Were they maybe the residents of no, uh, no. city? I know these officials people. or no, no, just regular. There's random. A, th- it was random. It was and people random. died that you knew. Yeah, a few people from our community were killed by these attacks. Just regular old elderly people. Even uh, one of them was a Holocaust survivor, actually. Wow. So that's the moment when stood. We have to get out. We have to get out, and we have to take out our community. We thought that you know maybe this is going to last a week or two weeks, and whatever happens happens. But we understood that something very serious is happening, and this is not going to end anytime soon. So, I couldn't find a car that day. The city was was being destroyed, and nobody was ready to take us out for no amount of money. You know, Eitan is a big fan of uh, apocalypse movies, and it just yeah. sounds like a, uh, this. Yeah, definitely, it definitely. A scene of a. You know, I told my wife, I don't think this is real. At a certain point, after a week of not eating, not sleeping, you start, you know, you even start hallucinating a little bit. You start imagining things. Even after we left Ukraine, I was still hearing things for a few weeks, you know, bombs and and things like that, because you know your body's under so much stress that that you start you're not acting regularly. Mm-hmm. So, so we did feel in a movie, you know, we, f- we felt that we're some in a movie, you know, there's tanks and things getting blown up and, uh, it's very scary. So what did you do about the car? So I couldn't find a car that whole day. And there were, that, that, that's the day when the bombings got, got like, uh, we felt like we were in a war zone. And, and that night I remember having like really bad thoughts, you know, I was thinking like, you know, maybe this is it, you know, we, we can't get out. I can't find the driver. And that, and then, uh, you know, in, in, um, I right away took out the, those thoughts and, you know, I said, you know, I have a wife, I have my kids, I, we have this beautiful community, we're going to get out, we're going to be safe and everything's going to be fine. You know, I got myself together. And in the morning we found the car. Uh, the, 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 he didn't answer the phone, the driver, and, and we had these, uh, again, explosions all morning and I was afraid that maybe something happened to him and he can't get to where we are. All of a sudden I get a phone call. He tells me either you get out right now with all your family, my parents, my, my siblings, or uh, or I'm going back home. It's too dangerous to be outside. So we just got ourselves together, and there were explosions. Like, we're running through bombs like in a movie, and we got into we got into the van, and we just went out. We just Wait, li- literally bombs exploding. Not on the st- street, but, yes, we're in the, in the city. In the horizon. In the, in the neighborhood. Yeah, the we're city. leaving, and we saw everything was like smoke in the skies. Wow. Yeah, it was smoke in the skies, and uh, and and the city was destroyed. Like we're driving, and 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 I have my kids there, so we're trying. You know, I'm trying to give that that good vibe, and you know that everything's gonna be fine. We're gonna go to Israel. I'm gonna see the grandparents, and everything's gonna be great. <coughs> and uh, but I'm my eyes are seeing buildings that I grew up with. I grew up in Kharkov all my life, and yeah. I'm seeing buildings that are destroyed, literally destroyed. Something like from Gaza scene. And what about the? all the people that were were with you in the shelter so so we so we got a big van and we started looking for buses to get out our community members because we have like 20,000 Jews in Kharkov so so we needed like re- big buses to start getting out people so that's what we started when we were leaving um so that that was our main concern our community because because you know we're gonna be fine but we we're so busy thinking about everybody else um because that that's how i was grow up that that's a way to grow up by the way uh you know just just to think about other people that keeps you in a better place you know when you're busy thinking about yourself you get depressed sometimes and and here we're so busy thinking about other people that it kept us sane throughout the whole thing because we felt that we're doing something really important and that's why we're here so so when we left we felt that void you know what's with our community what's with everybody there so a lot of people who had cars younger people they left on their own mm-hmm But other people from our community members, so we tried to get them on a train. and uh, Train still operated? Yeah, so, so it was crazy. Um, yeah, I'll show you a picture later. Uh, there was 600,000 people who left the train station. Uh, 
that first week of the war. And uh, it was crazy what was going on. 24-hour train ride to Lvov. People were standing there. There were people with guns there, not letting people on the train. So people were splitting the men from the from the women. Because you need, they, need, they wanted fighters, the Ukrainian uh, yes, army. Yes, yes. And also because there wasn't enough place and some people had to leave their belongings behind. It, it, was, it was chaos. It was real, real chaos, and um, but we tr- we helped as much people as possible, and uh, it was a long story, a two day story. It took us sixty hours to get to Israel. Uh, we, but wait, the bu- you found buses in uh, the end? Yes, we found buses, um, and from Moldova and from from outside of Ukraine. Mm-hmm. So they started driving towards Kharkov. We were driving already out, uh, and it was it was a uh, two days. We were traveling, and there were uh, Ukrainian soldiers who would get into our car every 15, 20 minutes. There were these big block posts, and uh, looking for Russians because a lot of Russians the first week of the war entered the country. And uh, it was a crazy it was a crazy ride, a crazy experience. We heard also explosions throughout the way, but we made it safe to Moldova. The driver just dropped us off there in the middle of the night. It was minus 10, freezing cold, uh, because he couldn't cross the border because mm-hmm. he's a local Ukrainian. Um, I was born in America, so I have, a, I have an American passport. So we were able to leave. And, but the problem is we didn't know how to cross the border. So mm-hmm. we were, I'm standing there with my kids, with everybody there. And and like <laughs> I asked the guy, how long is going to take us to walk through the border? I asked the guy who was standing in line. He tells me about 20 hours. And I'm there with another family. Because uh, the border is huge, basically. Because millions of people are trying to leave the country. So he had these but lines of people. Line. Yeah, just a huge line. And and like cars with no end no end in sight. So I, I wrote in the groups, I looked for some kind of help. You know, this is an emergency. I'm standing here outside with another family with a two month old baby. You know, th- we need help. We will freeze here. There's no way we could do this physically, stand for twenty hours. So thankfully, uh, a big bus from the Jewish community in Kiev sent their location. We looked for them. We went around. We found them. There was no place, but that didn't matter so much. We just got in and we made it to Moldova. Wow. A day later to Romania and from Romania wow. to Israel. I have to say, it makes me think about, you know, we are always so judgy against Polish Jews in the, in the late 30s, against Hungarian Jews in the early 40s. And of course, German Jews in the in the thirties. Um, like, why didn't they pack and and leave, right? And I, I and from your story, it makes me think about the human nature of of living in denial, even though you know, right, that something's bad going to happen. You 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 push it down, and because one week before you could take your kids, go to Kiev, take a flight, and bye bye, right? It was so easy. But it's so easy to live in denial, I guess, and and to and to hope for, right? I was actually thinking about that on the way from escaping. I was I was telling myself, you know, I finally understand these Jews in Germany. I imagine I was when I was reading all these Holocaust books. I was thinking to myself, why didn't why didn't they leave? Why didn't they leave? Their stores were being bombed. The shul was being uh, under fire, and people didn't leave. And and I felt that this way. You know, there's actually people here from our community in Kharkov who could elderly people who are allowed to leave the country who could come here to israel we're offering help to them and they don't want to leave they're not ready to still leave. now still till yeah today, five there's months a later, thousands from, thousands of jews in is still in ukraine who there's a there's leave. a woman from my uh that i know that whose parents are stuck there and they refuse to leave refuse they don't see themselves anywhere else anywhere else and, and you offer them money and a way to get out it doesn't matter did the russians they didn't conquer Kharkov at the end, right? No, but it was very close. They they attacked the, the Kharkov. The first week of the war was the city that was attacked the most mm-hmm. because uh, I don't know why. Maybe it's just it's a very, symbol. It's a symbol, I guess. Yeah, it's a very big city. It's a symbol. They thought Putin made a big mistake. He thought it's a very Russian, uh, pro-Russian city, so they could take it in a day or two. But uh, he was very wrong. Strategically, he was very wrong. So the Ukrainian army or or militia stopped. The, the, the Russian army. The Ukrainian army. They were ready. They were ready. And, and you know, <clears throat> I always thought the Ukrainian army is a joke and the Russian army is so powerful because every year they do this parade in the 9th of May and they, and they, they brainwashed me living in Ukraine. I thought Russia is the greatest army in the world. Mm-hmm. And in reality, their tanks were just falling apart, literally falling apart. There were grandmothers who were throwing in Kharkov uh, we we were getting videos in Telegram. Um, grandmothers were throwing Molotov cocktails on tanks, mm-hmm. and they were just setting them on fire. And yet, 
um, Russia is wreaking havoc and devastation upon Ukraine. So I wonder, do you, as someone who lived there and saw the devastation, do you, of course, it's it's very it's very uh, like um, it's very rational and logical and obvious to to criticize Putin. You know, he's the obvious bully here. He's the obvious belligerent. But do you have uh, criticism towards U Ukraine, towards Zelensky, towards the way that things were handled? I think um, I, I don't I don't try. You know, I, I stay away from politics in general. That's Chabad. That's our thing. You know, we, we don't get deep into politics. But definitely anybody who who is normal and and li lives a European with European values understands that what Russia is doing is is a atrocity besides the killing of the local people and and everything else just the 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 idea that you know we could just go to a different country and because we disagree with some of their politics and just take it over i mean i think that's ridiculous you know you, you can't just you can't just take over a different country because you don't agree because there's some kind of disagreement because nato or not nato whatever it is and um the people of Ukraine, 90 something percent are supporting Zelensky and everything he's doing. So, so maybe things could have been handled differently. I don't know. I'm not an, a political expert, but people are with him. You know, people like him and people, people don't want Russia. People don't want, uh, uh, you know, people know what life in Russia is. I've been to Russia sometimes. You know, you, you can't send, there's no freedom of speech. Like in in a way that they are you, now stopping the Jewish agency in Russia. Right, they're closing the Sochnut. Right, which is which is crazy, and and there's no freedom of speech. Like even the rabbis there, they can't express themselves. You mm -hmm. can't even send in a in a WhatsApp message. You can't write something against Putin. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's it could it could put you in, it, you could end up in jail. Yeah, you, you can't know? say it's a war in Russia. Yeah, you have to be you have to be special military operation. Yeah. I follow this YouTuber and a uh, very famous Russian YouTuber who's doing an English channel. And although he fled to Georgia, he still, because he wants to go back at some point, he still has to say special military operation. And uh, like, he's obviously joking about it, but he has no choice. And also when he says Facebook, he has to write down in the, in the you know, in a caveat, Facebook has, was declared as a hostile organization by a Russian government and also all. But, so, as I said, of course, Russia is the belligerent and Putin is committing atrocities. I have to say, though, as an Israeli looking at Ukraine and looking at the... There was a lot of criticism coming from Zelensky towards Israel for not supporting the Ukrainian military in a more, you know, in a stronger way. To me, it seems like getting involved in that from our end and i wonder what you think if israel's not doing enough it seems to me like it's not our struggle like i you know the 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 crimes that are being committed the crimes against humanity are clear to me and that's awful but but i wonder if you know and i and this i guess goes to the question about getting out like why not what and i guess to <laughs> even the que the broader question of chabad which is Shouldn't we all just be living in Israel? Uh, so I, I get that question asked a lot. I, I do now. Basically, I uh, I speak all around the world to raise awareness and money for Ukraine. Um, so I spoke in California and Seattle. I toured, and a, a lot of times I get asked this question: like, why doesn't everyone just leave? The reality is, some people are just going to stay, and some people are just going to be there. And as we were saying before. Some people are not ready to go. Some people are just not ready to leave. And Chabad needs to be there for them. There's no Right now, there's no other Jewish organization there in Kharkov. So if we're not there for them, and right now my father is actually there with my brother in Kharkov, even though there's bombings. Um, if we're not there for them, then, then who's going to be for them? Who's going to be there? Who's going to provide them with food, with medicine, I mean, we're talking about basic stuff that that people people are hungry, you know. So we're feeding over three hundred people just in Kharkov, and um, daily. So so this is this is uh, something very big that that we're dealing with right now. And but and in regards to what you were saying, uh, like, is what is Israel's part in all of this? I think, I think, you know, it's not Israel. 
Israel's business to to fight other people, other countries' wars, and Israel needs to take care of its own interests. But on the other hand, things like atrocities that when people are getting killed in mass graves, I think that's something that needs to be addressed. Addressed, and uh, you know, people are literally getting shot for no reason. Elderly people in in mass graves. This is something that the world should stand up against. Whether Israel should fight for Ukraine or other countries, I don't think that's you know Israel has is is a country with with a lot of its own problems. Uh, we're surrounded by Arab nations. Uh, there's Arabs, a lot of Arabs who are against Israelis here in Israel, living inside the country, which is which is a very serious problem. And if this gets out of hand, you know this could be just as dangerous as what's going on in Ukraine right now. But I mean, as far as people not leaving Ukraine and not leaving other places around the world to come to Israel, um, you know, I think there's a difference also between places like the United States, where currently it doesn't seem like there's much of a threat on the horizon and places like Ukraine and Eastern Europe and Russia, China, maybe, um, where things are not so comfortable. Is it's kind of like a I mean it's kind of like a parent whose child is you know not doing what they need to be doing is not taking responsibility over the, at some point you have to cut ties like are we not enabling the Jews around the world by setting up chabads everywhere to support Jewish communities in these in these places shouldn't they just leave and come home so that would be great if i would have a button like i could just press and and bring everybody here i would press that button there's no question about it but again going back to this that there's there's just certain people who are always going to live there and that's all they know and that is their culture and that is their home in their eyes and um and by us being there i don't think we're providing uh a, a safe haven for people to stay i think we're just we're just saving people from from right now just from dying and just staying safe um, in general, I think Chabad is, is there for everybody, wherever they are. And uh, just like the Israeli government sends people, including Ukraine right now, sends a representative from their government to be there, the same day we're, we're, we're representing Judaism in the world. So, so I don't think it's fair to say, like, you know, maybe to the Israeli government, maybe they should just leave all those countries. We have to, we have to keep on with diplomatic ties. We have to keep on helping the people in every way possible and uh, again it would be nice to bring everybody here and a lot of the refugees from Kharkov we, we did bring them to Israel we're dealing with hundreds of refugees who came from just from Kharkov and we did a very big event for them uh, during Purim and Pesach all these all the ho- all the holidays we got together we rented a big hotel a big place and we did a we did many events for them just to keep them you know together and give them some hope and uh, of course this is great that people are coming here but it's terrible what's what's happening there and actually one one of the hardest things for me was to find purpose when i came here so living in kharkov I, again i always felt that this is amazing i'm helping people it feels good i always felt great helping others and when i came to israel i felt you know what am i doing here you know this is like now how do i reinvent myself like what do i do here as a as a, you know there i was a rabbi i was providing and here i'm what am I, what do I do now? That was a very hard point for me. And my there's family. a lot of people in Tel Aviv who have lost a lot of touch with their Judaism. Yes, yeah, so there's a lot you of have, work. You have one right here that might need some uh, uh-huh. kiyuv. Yeah, <laughs> don't get me started about Chabad. I don't want to go there. But uh, but I do think Kiryat Malachi is a place that needs a lot of help. Every place, every place needs help. There's there's people all over us, and this is my message. Actually, my speech is that that we have to help everyone who we can. Everyone around us, whether it's spiritually or, you know, someone, sometimes someone needs a phone call, you know, how are you doing? What's up? You're good. You know, sometimes that could save somebody. So I think everybody should be an emissary and live their life every day like they're doing and helping others. Like that, that's a feeling, wake up in the morning, what, how am I going to help somebody and do something for somebody else? And that, that fills me up today. And that's why I, jo- I joined this amazing organization, which actually helped save my family. So the plane was organized by JRNU. Uh, this is an amazing organization that right now I'm the ambassador of fundraising for them and speaking uh, on behalf of them in the whole world just to fundraise money uh, for Ukraine, for the medicine. JRNU stands for? Uh, Jewish Relief Network Ukraine. Okay. Uh, so all the rabbis together, we got together, we, we made this big organization, and uh, we just want to help everybody there. Everybody who's still there, which is, we're talking about 
30,000 people that we're feeding in the country, giving out medicines. They send a list of medicines with whatever they need. We have 50 uh, people on the ground who are working for us in Ukraine full time. Including your father and your brother? Uh, no, besides right. the rabbis. We have 50 okay. like local people who are, who are sending out the food and doing everything ah. that we need for us. But your father and your brother are still there. Yeah, yeah. So they escaped together with us. Now they came back for some time. So what's the situation there right now? It's crazy. The, a bomb uh, Saturday morning, 6 o'clock, fell on their street and, and took out a whole building. Wow. So it's very dangerous. Very, very dangerous. Wow. But, but you know, so so a normal person here together, we're sitting here, we're thinking, you know, that's crazy. Why would someone do such a thing? But if you would see how many people he's saving there and what they're doing there, uh, it's just unbelievable. But, w- but what's the war situation? I, I, it's very hard, I think, now in the West for us to understand what is actually going on there now in this part of Ukraine. So, so that's the thing. A, a big part of uh, why I joined this organization, and I need, I need to tell people about what is going on. You see, the first month of the war, especially here in Israel, every day you would open up the news, it was mm-hmm. only Ukraine. Everything was Ukraine. But after a month, you know, people wanted to move on there's politics there's elections whatever's happening here in israel so people moved on but the truth is the war is getting worse so basically what happened was russia changed its tactic so they tried surrounding ukraine and taking over the whole country in a week or two that was their initial plan Mm -hmm. then they realized that is not work that does is not working out for them so they got out and now they're taking city by city Mm -hmm. slowly Mm -hmm. they're taking all our forces they took over Mariupol, Kherson, other cities, they're bombing Nikolaev like crazy right now. Kharkov, they're bombing. They're just bombing and bombing. And, and the, these bombings, they, they, they kill the people's um, hope, mm-hmm. right? So these random bombings, you're sitting there and you think, you know, maybe things are going to get... Because in the ground, Ukraine is winning. In Ukraine, the soldier, uh, on the ground, the soldiers are passionate. They're, they, they, they're fighting for a great cause and they're winning. But uh, They're not winning. Um, I wouldn't say they're they're not winning if they if they were winning there would be no war. okay they're not winning but they're 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 upholding the the status quo at best they're putting up a good fight Uh, they're putting up a good fight but it's also worth mentioning I think that uh, that Putin is not using even like 20% of his actual might even if if you look at the, the how many soldier he uses if you look at the fact that he doesn't use his air force at all Right, so he's not like. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't. Again, I'm not a mil- military. Full might. I'm not a military expert, but the bombing, the bombs that he is dropping on Ukraine are very serious. Yes, are very very serious, and the war is very serious. Um, it's hard for me to tell the you know all the details because there's propaganda on both sides, mainly from the Russian side, but also in Ukraine there's also mm-hmm. propaganda. There's things that are getting you know taken out of context and it's hard to find out the real truth you know it's amazing we live in the 21st century and there is you know facebook and all these media outlets that you could just see everything and still there's so much uh, misinformation misinformation so much yeah. misinformation so it's very hard to, to you know especially when we we're there in Kharkov, i couldn't even understand what is going on i'm there i'm there and i couldn't understand w- where are the russians right now did they enter didn't they enter did they conquer ukraine i was there i was located there and i was I had to call uh, you know community members uh, you, that building was bombed i had to figure out locally what is happening because ukraine also was trying to distort some of the news but obviously i don't think it's compared to the russian propaganda i mean russian propaganda is a whole different level yeah that's they like, invented it they, more yeah, or less, so. yeah that's a whole different level of propaganda so so but that's what we're dealing with and we have jews there and we have to help them, you know, we have to help them. And that's that's why I'm going around doing this, you know, just raising but awareness. Kharkov could still be conquered eventually. I hope it's not. On the, but it's on the, like, it's it's a It's on the Russian agenda. Yes, it's on the Russian agenda. And they're heavily bombing. And these bombings are, are killing the moral of the people. You know, people mm-hmm. are, how much can you be on their, it's very stressful. You know, when you're on their bombing, this, it affects you. It affects the way you feel. It affects your, your hopes. Uh, but you know we're trying. You know, as Jews, you know we were taught that we have to be positive and tachshav uh, tov yetov. You know, think good and it's going to be good. Mm-hmm. So even though things in reality are not looking good at all, but uh, we're trying to stay positive and we're trying to stay hopeful. It's good that there's a place to flee to. 
Yeah, so that's that's a big thing. When we were traveling, when we were getting out, so that's what kept us strong. Like we knew that we're gonna get to Israel. We knew that we have a place. We knew we have a home. And that's something when you're escaping from a place, that's very comforting. Like mm-hmm. to know that there's a place that you could find shelter, you could find hope. That's uh I mean throughout most of history Jews didn't have that privilege to have a place to fled flee to. Yes, yeah, so so that's something we we're very thankful for. Uh there's there's criticism towards the government. Uh they could have helped more in, in many ways uh by helping the Israeli people. government. Yeah, the Israeli government, mm-hmm. yes. Um there is criticism there, but uh but the fact that we have a hometown, a home place, a place to run to, a place when we came here uh, to be accepted uh all, all my community members including myself we made an aliyah and uh you know israel is supportive with that so we're very thankful yeah we're very thankful so uh first of all you're on social media yeah how can people find you so uh, i have an instagram account rabbi motivation that's probably something i do small short videos for people to stay motivated but right now jrnu.org this is our website and this is what we're presenting so if anybody wants to support the jews of ukraine Uh, this is the biggest organization right now that knows of all these rabbis who were there for 30 years know the community this is money that is going directly to uh, to Jewish people there for food and uh, medicine right now we're working on a project for the winter because uh, people might not have a way to survive the winter so we need to provide them also with heating and the money to pay their bills to in order that they shouldn't get kicked out of their homes so mm-hmm. if anybody can support and listening to us jrnu.org it will be greatly appreciated amazing thank you so much for thank coming you. thanks for having me it was thank you so much very touching. so much thank you so much thank you <laughs> thank you for having me. um guys please rate us on spotify wow that's a big segue okay never mind scratch that but rate us on spotify yeah, why us. no don't scratch yeah. that rate yeah. us rate that's us. also another rate way to help jews yeah by rating us on Spotify not to compare um, um, thank you so much for joining us thank, thank you, you guys for tuning in thank you see you on the next one time. guys bye bye bye